Very early in my time here as Bishop of Madison, I had the pleasure of meeting Damon Boatwright, who works for SSM Health. And in a very generous and joyous way, he reached out to me because he wanted a relationship with the new bishop, and I've certainly welcomed that relationship as well. And just several weeks ago, in light of um, everything going on in our country in the wake of the death of George Floyd and the protests and the unrest and uh, our national discussion about racism and race, Damon and I had a great phone conversation and we both mutually agreed it would be wonderful to put it on video in a way just to share that conversation and, and your thoughts, Damon, about this subject. And I think as an African-American man as an African-American Catholic who works for a Catholic institution, um, your insights would be very insightful for all of us. So that's really kind of the, the gist and the start of this video and this conversation. So I just yeah. invite you to just start reflecting, Damon, on what what's in your mind and heart. Well, one, I want to thank you, Bishop, for having me here today to have this conversation with you, a continual a conversation from some previous ones that you and I have had uh, together and uh, I will tell you when I read the letter that uh, the bishops in the state of Wisconsin uh, put together and then disseminated out far and wide uh, to many of the parishioners and then I read your subsequent letter um, behind that one that was just so uh, touching so poignant uh, and illuminating uh, in many ways. And it sort of brought out a lot of things that I had inside of me that I was feeling too. And that's when I wanted to reach out to you mm -hmm. and say, I would love to have this sort of continual conversation um, about race and particularly in how you framed it uh, through a spiritual lens, because it just seems to me in my own humble uh, personal opinion um, a spiritual framing of the issue has been missing um, by and large um, through external uh, communications. And so I thought now's as good a time as any uh, for maybe the two of us to have that conversation together. Oh, absolutely. So, and I thank you for your openness to that. Now, something we reflected on was just the power of Dr. Martin Luther King's example and leadership. And we were saying how he used the scriptural vision of justice and our identity as children of God is really the ground or the framework for what he did in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Used religious language. Um, I know the the nonviolent protesters sang spiritual songs even when they were being attacked. So there's this whole Christian vision to that movement, and that's something that is kind of missing from the national conversation today, as you said. And maybe it's just evidence of how far religion, in a sense, has been kind of maybe pushed out of the public square or is no longer the common language that we even understand and express together. And I think that's part of it. Um, part of it, too, I think, is just the, the church's emphasis on human dignity. And you know, in the letter, I reflected on the long, really evil history of slavery in our country. And we can never uh, simply ignore or somehow erase the fact that, you know, for centuries, um, this country, even its, in its leadership, was complicit in the, the exploitation, the, the enslavement, the, the torture, and even murder of you know, African Americans who were brought here as slaves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then the aftermath of the Civil War that we realized that even emancipation from slavery was just one step towards full human liberation and equality. And I don't think by any means can we say that we fully arrived, mm -hmm. but I think we can certainly say thing, things are better than they were, but that's not to say that we are where we need to be. Right. And then and two points I want to expand uh, on that. Uh, one, um, Martin Luther King Jr., through his writings, uh, through his uh, communication, uh, 
verbal as well as demonstrations uh, that he helped organize and he helped lead. I think it was then clearly and I think continues to be now uh, a great sort of role model and example of sort of the, the, uh, the passion uh, around just human equality. Yes. I mean, just even if you take it out of any sort of racial lens, it's just really human equality yes. uh, more so than anything else. And even on a, a global uh, stage, and, and he wasn't alone. I mean, he admittedly said he was inspired by uh, Mother Teresa and he was inspired by Gandhi um, and two other individuals, uh, clearly, uh, who uh, both were very religiously grounded, um, but saw the dignity uh, in each uh, individual. And I think uh, for me, uh, being Catholic um, myself and and my, my family and my two kids are all um, Catholic. Um, and I think I've uh, fundamentally believed for a very long time uh, that there's sort of unique intrinsic worth and value in each person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I also believe that we all come uh, with our own flaws and our own weaknesses. I don't think there's any one uh, person per se um, other than Jesus that I know of, but I know Bishop will correct me for the record, uh, that, that came into this world um, uh, who uh, probably had less uh, flaws and weaknesses that most of us as human beings uh, have uh, in sin, uh, but most of us have it. And, and so, you know, I, I think of, you know, who am I to judge, you know, others um, when I would first try to look to how can I help this other individual so both of us together can be stronger uh, with one another uh, and in union um, uh, with our creator and the design that he has for all of us. Um, but I think it gets back to that unique intrinsic worth and value for that individual. And to me, regardless of whether someone comes from a rural background, an urban background, whether they're black or white or somewhere in between, um, the fact is there should be more that brings us together yeah. uh, ultimately than, than all of the divisiveness the world would put in front of us to make us believe uh, that we should be separated and we should be fighting each other. Great. Yeah, do we look first at what makes us different from each other or do we look first at what we have in common? And I think the Christian vision is that I can look at any human being regardless of their circumstances or their identity and say, this is my sister, my brother. Or this is a person that God has created in his image and likeness. This is a person loved by Jesus Christ. This is a person of inherent worth and dignity that I am called to respect, to love, and to care for. So if we lived in a culture where that was paramount, where that was the cornerstone, just imagine how different everything would be. So it just seems we've We've divided up the human race into all these tribes and groups and subsections and categories. Mm -hmm. And what it's done is, is disunify us mm -hmm. to the point where we look across these chasms of, of fear, of prejudice, of indifference, as if somehow that person has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. You know, and we think, you know, every person is my responsibility because every person is my brother my sister and that's really the, the vision of the church absolutely and bishop and to that end i would just say um I, as i look back now um and i don't know if it's coincidence or divine providence but when i when i grew up um i actually i came from an uh, african methodist episcopalian um background uh, mixed in with some Southern Baptism uh, in there as well. Um, and That's quite a background. I know, exactly. <laughs> and all of my friends um, that I grew up with from, the, from seven years old, seven, eight years of age, when we moved uh, to a, a small town right outside of Charleston, South Carolina, um, all my friends at the time, and, and I didn't really make the connection until I was gotten to college, but... All my friends at the time, actually, they were Catholic families. 
Um, they one was Hispanic um, background. Um, another one was a, a Filipino background. Uh, another really really close friend uh, was an Italian uh, background and descent. The other was uh, Polish, um, and and we were um, thick as thieves. They would say, right? We just all grew up with each other ever since the age of seven, eight years old. I was the outsider at eight years old, by the way, because they were from uh, that, that small little town uh, and they, they took me in. But I, I say that, Bishop, because we all went to church together. We did sleepovers together. We played football together. You know, we um, um, fell off our individual bikes, you know, around the, the same time and all of our families knew each other and we did sleepovers uh, together, right? We ate at the same table. Uh, and broke bread. Um, and so all of those individuals I just mentioned to you, they were all in my wedding. Uh, I am the um, godfather of uh, four of the five uh, of their first uh, kids and they're mine. And so they're like family. They're literally like family to me. And when I went to college, I actually proselytized over to Catholicism. Um, make a long story short, I really had sort of two options. There was in the school that I went to, um, there's a military college in South Carolina. Uh, and you um, could be, uh, you had a Protestant or Catholic and Catholic was closer to the AME church I was mm. used to. And so mm. I proselytized um, to be Catholic. But um, as I think about the diversity of the church itself, and I think about my own background and experiences, I mean, it's all sort of taught me to this, led me to this point um, that it's the, the richness in that diversity, but also if it comes with some kind of unifier, uh, to your point, something that sort of brings us together versus keep us separated and apart, um, that's where love manifests itself uh, at the end of the day, um, where you can really begin to, like I said, enable the best of what we're meant to be um, as human beings.